Are there any adjustments to the agenda that anyone has? Okay. Um, approve the minutes of Monday, March 28th. So moved. Do I have a second? Second, Ethan. Is there, is there any discussion on the yes. minutes? Bill has discussion. Two small points, but under uh, 8.5 and 8.7, 8.5B, we've got a new account, right? Yes. Aha! And we're celebrating. So, so I, that's the way I spell. And 8.7 is more of a question. The policy committee, we're going to be working on two additional policies, um, social media and verification of student residency. And I looked in our policy notebook and I thought we already had a verification of student residency. So I'm wondering whether that's the one or there's a reason to go back to it again because it was 2019. They yeah, were going back to They're it. going back to it. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So there's no change there. Thank you. So, so um, we'd like to, um, like to approve the minutes with Bill's change of spelling. Hmm. Of a spelling error? Oh, and one other thing, sorry. This is my thing. Under 8.2, if I could. Um, what's MTAA strategy? I wonder if that's MTSS. Yes, yeah, that's or, another typo on the part of your uh, clerk who did not review her minutes before submitting them. Thank you, Bill. No, I, um, I'm missing. I, I, I'm starting a new vocabulary thing in my notebook about terms. Because I'm, I'm a slow learner on that one. So I wasn't sure whether that was a new term that I just wasn't aware of. So. No, thank you. I'm really, I'm really sorry. I was, uh, right. last, sometimes when keeping minutes, I, uh, I pay attention to meetings and then my note taking starts to lapse. Usually I have time to review them after. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're going to change MTAA to MTSS and we're going to change, um, um, the hire of a new accountant instead of new account was a new accountant. Right. Any other discussion? If not, then it's. Can we approve them with those amendments? Yes. Yeah, so can, can we approve the minutes with the. With the I have in my motion to, to um, approve the minutes with the amendments um, you just said. Second. Second. All right. Thanks, guys. Don't Thank move. you, Bill. Thank you for reading the minutes. Um, board correspondence and communication. Does anybody has anybody received anything this month? I have not. Okay. So. I'll go see if Phil's here. <laughs> if not, we can go on to reports. Phil is here. The person to do the presentation tonight. So we're just waiting. Jamie's checking on where is he just did the board chair training. Um so now he's I think had a call in between. So we'll wait for him to come in. Um I'll skip to public comments. Are there any public comments? Anybody on? He's just going to use the restroom. Do we want to start with reports? Oh, perfect. Um, we don't have any public comments. You want to start with my report? So we will go to Jamie's report while we're waiting to, for Phil to get in. Uh, so you have my report in hand. Um, I, I want to just highlight, I'm really excited uh, about the work that we have planned for the upcoming summer months. Um, there's a lot of really exciting proposals coming for, out of each district. Um, and there's some cross pollinating around the work that will occur across some of the districts. So um, I just really wanted to highlight that. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight, um, I knew there was, there was a, a few questions about when we would have upcoming data reports. Um, and so I just wanted, I asked, did you get that email right? Ready to project just so the boards know what's coming up. This was adopted in August by the board. Um, and what was presented was 
um, both the budget calendar, how we would go about budget development, and then when we would see academic and social emotional data. And so if you keep scrolling down, you'll see, and I mentioned it, um, or it's on the agenda for future items, is a presentation on our alternative social emotional programming for next month. Um, and that will hit the special ed data report. And then also at your local districts, you'll get social emotional data um, at each district level, uh, which you've received previously this year too. And we'll, we'll look at some comparisons throughout the year, but also across um, as compared to last year. Um, and then finally, you'll see that our benchmark assessment data will be in June for our local assessments, meaning track my progress and star 360. You'll get those at the YesU level and also at your local districts. Um, that assessment happens in May. Um, and we're currently happening with um, SBAC testing right now. I don't expect those to become, and you'll see we, we did predict this, unembargoed until August. Um, and so the, that's when we'll plan to present your Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. Um, and so just want to remind you of this data calendar. We'll definitely look for feedback on it, and then we'll have another one uh, to put forward to folks for consideration next August. Um, and then I also uh, just wanted to highlight, we're got, we've got some, um, we're moving back to in-person PD, which I'm really excited about, meaning more on a state level. Um, so we do have the Vermont um, Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports Conference happening at the Killington Grand, but, which is sponsored by UVM and the Best. Um, which we had schools attend for a long time, but it's been virtual the last two years. And so it's finally back to in-person. And so we have multiple teams going to that, which I think will be great. Um, and then also the admin retreat we plan to do at the VPA conference so we can engage in professional development in the morning. Um, and then we will do our retreat work in the afternoon um, at, the, uh, at the VPA conference. So. Um, a lot of good uh, work planned for the summer. You know, I think the summer is when you can really lay down the roadmap for execution the following year. I mean, I really think to try to plan and execute a plan while the school year is going is that you find that you typically don't execute much of anything. So if we can get solid plans in place along with some PD, come on in, Phil, and then we'll turn right to you after I entertain questions um, over the summer. I think that's going to serve us uh, well. And I'll take any question folks have. I did, oh, the legislation, uh, I said I would give an update tonight, and I did put a link in there. Uh, so we continue to follow uh, closely, you know, the legislature can do an abrupt turn. Uh, we're kind of at the 11th hour, so we're following the waiting study uh, closely and looking like they're going to go with the waiting part of the equalized pupils. That was the last um, information that we had um, at a committee, anyways, that was gaining traction. I had shared that data with you back in January, uh, how that would affect us. In most districts, it's going to affect us positively um, in regards to um, tax rates. The other thing um, that we're monitoring closely right now is PCBs mitigation and whether or not the legislature is going to consider, to consider putting some funds toward assisting with that mitigation. Um, and so there's been a little momentum there on that. Um, I have reached out to some representatives today uh, to try to to try to let them know that if we're going to be doing testing, then we need to be thinking about how we're going to pay for mitigation efforts. Some of our schools, we just found out today, are um, going to be in the first round of testing. The results, we don't expect them back for about 12 weeks. Um, but that that is going to be happening in some of our buildings this spring. Um, and so that's something I'm watching really closely. And then just a reminder that it does look like they're no longer going to be delaying um, the special ed funding law, which we budgeted for the block grant anyways, uh, that that will move forward as um, planned. They have been delayed uh, previously. Uh, that was supposed to take effect prior to even this year. And there was a uh, movement to try to delay it again. Um, and so those are the things that we're following closely. The miscellany I said, Bill, that's something I always try to keep a really tight eye on. I just recommend to boards as, as you're getting the VSBA information 
because sometimes something can get uh, put in that bill um, that hasn't really necessarily been discussed prior. Um, and so that's something that we're, I'm watching closely as well. And I'll take any questions folks may have. Don has his hand up. Hey, Don. Hi, Don. How you doing, Jamie? Hi, well, just a couple of questions. Um, the attendance for the Killington thing, it looks like there's a few, most schools have got representation going. Is there any way to encourage some for everybody so that we can have some, some group efforts in that project that you're going to be working on just so that it's abroad, all abroad, the issue. And the next one would be the, uh, now I'll wait for that response and I'll think of the other one. Okay. I just lost it. Yeah, no, thanks, Don. So, um, the White River Unified District has gone in the past um, to the best the last two years. Um, I think that they they plan on doing some work socially emotionally, just like Newton does, um, but it may not be through best. All of our schools are aligned to PBIS practices. Some are a little farther along than others, and some are having more focused work right now on certain parts of the system. Um, but I do feel good about that we are all aligning ourselves to those practices like you're saying uh, and part of it too was i think just timing of when that was happening in late june and teams make it certain that you know schools really feeling like they had a, a set of team that met really the criteria around having multiple stakeholders right to get buying um, with the team. okay so i think the timing um was difficult for a few districts as well uh, hopefully they'll they'll listen to the project total in the buy-in if on that PB, pcb yeah some of the some of the schools were tested in that uh, project that went around can't they use the results for those uh the aoe is collecting their own they want their own data just like lead testing yeah okay uh, and so they're going to come around and test every school just like they did with lead all right thank you Yeah, um, on the wing, uh, it seemed like the legislature was looking at two possibilities. One is to change the formula to eliminate the unfair, uh, basically under counting and under um, supporting rural communities like our own. And the second one was speak about that, but then kind of have a nest egg. And each year the legislature would have the freedom to so are they actually going to change the formula so the legislature can't each year kind of? Correct. Yeah. They're, so they're looking at changing what we know now. They still have equalized pupils. How those, how that average daily membership is weighted, that formula would that change. change. Okay. Yeah. Because that's the struggle. Which I think team. is, that's, the, I, that's my preferred method um, right now based on their two, um, the two that they were, the one with the other one was the cost equity model right, where it was going to look more like a block grant, yeah. and you were going to be given chunks of money based on certain demographics of students, yeah. um, which I felt like was a little more convoluted, frankly, um, in regards to how that was going to work. And I was actually worried that it may require a lot more adjustment versus um, the waiting formula, of which I think now we've been using equalized pupils for quite a while in this state. That people are finally like i feel like as i talk to constituents they finally start to wrap their heads around it i think if all of a sudden we just go and change that model then now we're having to learn a whole new model yeah. of how that impacts our tax rate um and so i feel like at least this this um carries forward with the equalized pupils that folks have become more accustomed to the only thing is just an observation um reading your report on this report and that's the report our staff are doing remarkable things in the team, the educational team, the SU team, and all our districts are, are not taking any time off. They're working through the summer. Not every day, not necessarily Saturday, Sunday, they're working. And I just want to make an observation here that we as their elected leaders, they just might like step up too and think about how we can spend some of our, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking, <laughs> whatever it is. I'm out of here. Because, uh, uh, um, it, it really shows that summer is not a time to stop. Summer is a time to reorganize, plan, and get ready and become focused 
and then prepared for the coming year. And we as the SU board and our individual boards have, I think, the same responsibilities and the summer can be seen in that way for us too. And we should think about that. Last meeting makes it easier for me. <laughs> but I agree with you. <laughs> All right. Anybody else got questions for Jamie before we move on to our presentation? Okay. So how many people in the room and online just had to listen to me for an hour and a half or more? We were on. We were on. One, two, three, on. four, five. Yeah. Quite a few of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're going to so, have to really spice it up. I, I know. Well, you know, the bad news is that the content for the conversation with you is so similar, right? Because um, I was asked to talk about board meetings, board meeting protocols, and so forth. And we really got into a lot of that in the last hour and a half to two. And I, I was curious, rather than go through, I, I, worst thing in the world would be this to be redundant for five or so people. So, did I say anything, or were there follow-up things that you and others might have some questions to have a conversation about it, rather than me just sit here and say the same things? Well, I, mean, I think the interesting takeaway was for me is that we do a lot of the things that you were were saying was that were good practices. So, what are those things? Um, the public comment and keeping that to a minimum. And, but hearing the people, we do two public comments, so usually that works well for us. We don't have two public comments, but um, uh, that's the one thing I think of. Okay. Probably can make a lot more of that. No, that's all right. <laughs> Anybody else? Other other things that um, Big communication. were said? Dr. Gore. Yeah. Don Shaw from Sharon. Um, enjoyed your presentation earlier, I, but there was, we're a, quite a unique configuration of SUs as a district, or districts into SUs, and I just wondered if you had any words of wisdom that might help us to formulate a, a more cohesive structure. Maybe not much. Um, what, how many districts are there in the SU? Six. Six? Okay. And because this is unchartered territory. Right. I mean, our, our nation over the last 150 years has gone through all kinds of consolidation. We used to have thousands and thousands of school districts. I mean, more more than 100,000, maybe even more than 200,000. So the, the, the pain points that are here have been around for every at least every since school buses were then. Right. That was the big sort of move to efficiency was a lot of consolidated high schools in particular. Um, so I, I appreciate the question, partly because I don't have a brilliant answer, and you're pushing me to think about where might there be some brilliant answers. Um, I, I've seen the research in the last couple of decades of the, the challenges, the problems, the pitfalls of consolidation, um, but I don't know that that would be helpful to even try to regurgitate. I think solutions are, are what needs to be in order. One of the things, uh, Don, here that at least on paper seems like extremely commendable is your strategic plan. And I don't know exactly, I, I saw the document on the table out here and referred to it in the webinar I was just doing. But when I saw the, the different, the roadmap of the goals and in particular how things are reported out on, um, I haven't seen anything of that level of quality in Vermont yet. I'm working with Champlain Valley School District on developing a strategic plan for them. Uh, I met with a board last week that they wanted a strategic plan just for their school um, or two schools. Uh, and But it's more like a board governance work plan, not what we would call a strategic plan. But when I saw um, documents in advance of how you look at data over time, I, I, again, I, I probably can't highlight that that's outstanding practice, um, promising practice, best practice, uh, that how, how you do both, how you perhaps 
capitalize on what should be efficiencies out of uh, consolidation and how you retain some kind of a local school identity, local district identity, and uh, ensure participation at the local level. I, I think that's a challenge that I need to know more about, um, frankly, and, and others obviously around Vermont are having the exact same questions. Um, everywhere we go, Act 46, it might as well be the F word. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of heartburn for folks. Um, Sarah has her hand up. Yeah, Sarah. Hi, um, thanks. I had some, uh, I enjoyed your presentation um, and I had some some questions or just, just uh, sort of wanted to dig deeper into some of the things that you were talking about. And, and um, the first thing was that you said uh, effective governance is strategic. And I agree with that. I mean, I would agree with that. Uh, what I struggle with um, is that we have like two hour meetings once a month. We have new board members coming on once a year, either one or two, and sometimes three new board members coming on at a time. And we have our retreat in July, say, or August, you know, in the, in the summer. And so um, some of our board members have, are ready to, you know, in a, half, in a half a year, they're going to be getting off. New people are going to be coming on at that time. And so other than just putting out fires or doing the, the basic um, superintendent's report, you know, everybody's report, and then the, the issue that we're dealing with at the time, I don't know how you get strategic. Well, so you know those are the factors. I mean, if you were doing a, a SWOT analysis on what you just said, you know, <laughs> Here, here's the threats. We've got this turnover. We know the turnover is coming. Um, how do you stay intentional throughout the year? And you know, one of those resources I was mentioning, this book in particular, the Governance Core, where there's a whole chapter four that's dedicated to onboarding new members. Mm -hmm. um, this would be extremely worthwhile read. Um, I'm not going to suggest because I don't know if the SU could buy these for all the board members, but they're about 25 bucks on Amazon. Um, it, it's it's an easy digestible read, but um, that emphasis they make in there on how you onboard new members. Let me back up and wrap some things around that. Like one of the opportunities most boards fail to do is build more community awareness of what the school board actually does. And so you might think about, particularly at the school district level, where you've got maybe more proximity to more people. How might you build a five minute component in your meetings that is about what the school board does? How might that be uh, a part of just the routine? Uh, whether you're, you know, you, you're taking the big um, topics, the big buckets first, you know, policy and uh, what, what you do or do not have to do with, with budget, what you do or do not have to do with personnel how you do your work together, like those, those big buckets. And kind of, again, I'll just, not to overuse that word, but very strategically or intentionally uh, have like a five minute explanation of that or a conversation at the dais about, um, about that. But you could do it another way. You could do it as a five minute learning opportunity that, um, rotate around so board members are actually taking turns doing a presentation on a topic which forces them to do a deeper dive on how do we govern through policy as an example you could do that you could take turns and have a different person lead the conversation you could also take a book like this or the other one i, I mentioned i've got here too but i know half of you've seen them um, improving school board effectiveness what if your board did a book study on that? And I, I know I mentioned that earlier, but I, I bring it to this piece of it because part of it, what you're doing is you're building capacity among the current board, but then you're building capacity among whoever else happens to hear, uh, which might include staff members, uh, who else hears so more people understand the work of a board. 
one of the travesties really in school governance is that people working in the system rarely understand school governance. And no offense to anyone in this meeting right now, but a lot of folks come from a background in education. Nationally, 25% of people on school boards used to be an educator in some form or another. And we imagine that we know all about school governance because we've been in schools for 30 years, but governance is a whole other animal, right? It's not, it's not teaching kids, it's not making things per se with our hands and, and doing things like that. It, it, it's, it's, a different, it's a different role. Um, so all you can do in the system, anything you can do in the system to build understanding of what good governance looks like it, it just kind of expands capacity for all. And I think it addresses, Sarah, what you were getting at, you know, there with, with turnover. You always got some leaving, you always got some coming, you don't necessarily know who they are. Um, but being, in, and they emphasize that in chapter four, being very intentional about onboarding new members, assigning a mentor, uh, making sure everyone has someone that they know who they can go to for some support. Do you think assigning a mentor is a good idea? To new board members, that's not something we've practiced in it. It sounds like a good idea. Yeah, you would think at each board the chair could take that um, responsibility of assigning a veteran member, pairing them up. And, and I think um, a lot of board members, when they first start out, figuring out um, what their worth and what their value is on the board. Like, I'm not making any difference. And I think when you, yes. when you sign up to be on the board, you think, oh, I'm going to change. Or make all these changes it's going to be great and then you realize it really doesn't work that way but that doesn't mean you're not valuable um and doing things is just not maybe exactly what you thought it looked like so maybe a mentor could help yes um, show that and, and show how you can make a difference because i think you know if we're on a board for five to seven years we're going to go through a period where we're like man am i making any difference right so then connecting those dots for people here's how you make a difference that similar story to what you're talking about and i i had a child in elementary school a child in middle school and one in high school i got on a school board and i thought i was going to somehow make a difference for them and we're talking about you know easements into perpetuity that we're assigning to you know uh, fiber lines or what, whatever it was and it was like Wait, wait a minute. That's there's not more pencils for my son in second grade or third grade. You know right. that 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 disconnect. And I think again, whether people come from PTA type involvement or even working in education, being on a school board is not what we thought it was. And so it can be it can be frustrating. Am I making any difference? But the research is really conclusive that if you know if boards will focus, and they'll they'll have the conversations about vision, have the conversations about why, um, and they'll lead through goals and then monitoring goals. That's why I was excited when I saw the reports that you used. Um, very, very impressive. The amount of information is there. The, the question always becomes, it can be a lot of information, but is it the right information the board needs to be able to say, are we making progress? Are we take to borrow adequate progress but you know are we making the progress on our goals that we have agreed to as a system these are what's important and and then in meeting management are our meetings tied to our goals if you were to do an autopsy of your agendas over the last year or two and sort of go through and do a qualitative analysis of okay what were we talking about like does that match up with what you said were your priorities that you were going to be talking about? Or what the board has said is important. So does does that does that line up? Um, as you think about meeting management, and I know we we had a lot in the last couple hours on comments from the public and so forth, and, and how do you manage that? I, I do want to go ahead and underscore. We don't need to see my slides at all. They're they're not worth anything. Um, the, but that that idea that you know just we're these are public meetings, but they're not a meeting of the public. And, and the board can deteriorate really quickly. I told this story about somebody in the audience making a motion to buy a certain curriculum, and then all to find out later that that was the superintendent's wife. 
And I mean, that one just screams conflict of interest. I, I know she worked in education somewhere or something, but she from the audience raised her hand and made a motion. And um, I know that that happens in school districts uh, all across the country, different places. So now that that can't happen, though. I mean, you know, it's just it just reeks with possible conflicts of interest if somebody in the audience is seconding something or if the board is doing something simply persuaded by an audience member, right? There's just too much room for um, beyond gray. So what we've done, what we've been doing is that we do our public comments and then if it's something where we know we have a lot of public commenting that night, like our anti-racism policy, when we worked on that, we had two and a half hours, I think, one night that was public comment and we gave everybody a minute each. Mm -hmm. Were you really seeking input or were you just giving the allowance for public comment? Both. Okay. I think we were, we were letting people give their opinion and talk about it. and then we would go back because it was when we were still um, in committee. Having a hard time hearing you, Kathy. Sorry. Um, I said our pu public comment when, like, anti-racism policy, for instance, he asked if we were seeking input or what was, how did you Or just it? having comment. Or just right. having comment. We really didn't engage in conversation. We just let people make their comments and then we took notes and then talked about it as a board after. But we, we really limited the conversation because it can take over your meeting and we got much better at doing that. Well, and when you're doing something that's that kind of magnitude or visibility, I mean, it is wise to have a very dedicated time it's more time than usual, right? So right. that people can be involved. And that was one of the things I underscored in the webinar earlier that the research shows that if a board is involving their community in governance level conversations, they're more likely to be leading a district that's improving in student learning and closing gaps, which is this elusive thing we've been talking about for at least three decades, maybe more about achievement gaps, achievement gaps, but they're no better than what they were 30 years ago. And so we we have to figure out how to quit talking about achievement gaps and do something different, right? And, and I do think, um, I, I was surprised to find uh, a strong statistical evidence in the last state where I work between boards that are saying they're engaging and involving their community in governance work and they're actually governing a system that's improving and achievement and closing gaps. Um, that, that's been a hard one to show. But the, uh, I, I think too, and I'm a back, this is more just, you know, researcher cap. Uh, I think it's about the culture. Do, do people feel included? Do, and, and what is the board doing to make people feel welcome? And we wanna hear from them. And, and I know I mentioned earlier how dissatisfying it is to go give your comments to anyone. I mean, the legislature, it's, you know, worse, right? Where you're there, you're given, you're given your comments and you thought they wanted your input. Maybe even somebody said they wanted your input, but they'd say, thank you for your input. And that's the end of it. How, how does the board follow up? So it's not just the trite thank you for your input, but is there a letter, an email from board chairs or the superintendent that says, you know, we appreciate your comment at the board meeting. Is there a way to follow up? And then I don't know, you know, if you have 200 people making public comment, that's maybe too much coffee or too much something. Like, how do you, how do you get one-on-one -on -one with those folks um, or leaders from those groups? Um, you might think about. We literally, we usually do not have public comment like that. Yeah, like not at all. That, no. Yeah. It, like tonight, I think maybe we have one or two people on for public, and that's pretty much what we get for public at our meetings. <clears throat> so you, and in, at least here and in EPFA, we'll have. Exactly. What do you do in your annual retreat in July when people want to be on vacation? <laughs> what do you what do you do during that time? So it varies for us. We do um we did some team building at one point. We did um we had some issues on the board, so we worked through some of the, the conflict issues we had. Um we also had a big um vote coming and we wanted to make sure that we were prepared for it, so we strategized on that. 
It really, it, for me, in the, the three years I've been on the board this time, it's been around um, really what we needed. So it changes depending upon what we need. But we just did our retreat. Um, um, and we did a lot of, we went to one of the board members' houses and we had um, dinner. And we just did a lot of brainstorming and talking about what next year was going to look like. I mean, ne next year is a big step for us because we're actually changing the structure of our unified district now. So we did a lot of talk about, we just, we just got together and talked and went through and did brainstorming. So we did ours now. And I think it's, it feels effective that this time of year is more important than July because we did it in July, and next year has really already started. They haven't gone to school, but what you're going to do has already started. So, and I would be, I would encourage you to really think multi-year too, right? That when you think about planning, um, I agree. If you're going to like set an agenda for the year, for the next school year, and you do that in July, it's too late. Right. But if you think about like if the board collectively they they wanted to expand, even outdoor education, but in particular like career and technical education, that that's not something to start the conversation in July, and it's maybe even too late to start it now for next August, September. It's almost like you need to be thinking about 26, 27, if we were going to all of a sudden start, you know, offering a welding certification or something like that, then that may involve not just budget, but it might be personnel, it might be facilities, could be any number of things, as well as grants and engagement opportunities. So thinking about it, you're always, and you know, administrators, they know this, and the teachers, to some extent, oh, it's not the same, but you're, you're executing this year, but you've got to be planning for next year, and maybe even the following year. So as you think about, like, strategic, what does it mean? It is farther out, and parent school board members sometimes not quite so satisfying. Right. Yeah. You had something to say or I'm sorry. Yeah, a couple one observation is that our administrative team is um, our strategic plan that you looked at uh, expires in 2021 and the leadership of our superintendent and his management team they're going to be weighing in and, and creating a successor document that will be coming back to the SU board um, in the districts uh, early in the fall. So we've got that in motion. Uh, you've got that sense of strategic built into this uh, system. And um, I agree, it's important and that's moving. Um, Sarah mentioned, you mentioned, uh, Kathy mentioned, several of us mentioned about the power of retreats. Uh, with our agendas, they're packed. Of, we're gathering information, we're assessing information, we're asking some, inf some questions, trying to get a better fix, but there isn't that much time to do that strategic. That's the power in my mind of retreats. And whether it's a retreat that we do before we go into serious budgeting, because as Jamie has said, the budget is a reflection of our goals. It's a reflection of our strategy. It's a reflection of what we want to do going forward. Right. And so one question is that should we as an SU or the district boards um, spend some focused time uh, either separately from our, our monthly meetings um, or as a retreat to focus then. Uh, I know under uh, Ethan Bowen's leadership, we had a re very good retreat in early in September. And we got acquainted, we did some team building, and then we talked about goals. Where do we want to go as a board? Where do we want to go? And um, those are the questions that are very powerful and we need to ask in um, and listen to each other and then um, um, agree and, and, and move forward. And uh, we did a number of those steps based on that retreat, which was very, very powerful. So I think we can do both, but it's pretty hard when we're all volunteers and um, we've got all sorts of things going on to spend the time um, with that strategic thinking. And I think one of the best tools is, is, is retreat. Um, at the SU level or at the, uh, and, and the district level. And it sounds like we're doing that in a way. It sounds like we're frustrated because we don't have the time that we'd like to spend to do it as fulfilling as we can. But um, 
I happen to believe one reason why this SU is moving, accelerating forward. I mean, we're taking off. I mean, we're off. We're off the, off the tarmac. We're we're flying. Um, is that we're we're doing both, both the day to day the, and the accountability, but we're also doing the dreaming and the vision and the, and the goal setting. And if time. we can keep that, um, boy, who knows what we can. Well, and back to Sarah's point earlier with turnover, how do you do it in a sustainable way? So, I mean, because part of me says, well, if one retreat's good, wouldn't two retreats be better? But um, I also am fully aware that everybody's time is adapt, and maybe you'd want to do two, maybe you wouldn't, maybe you'd want to do three, maybe you wouldn't. But to Sarah's point, that idea of sustainability, um, how do you make sure these are in written protocols? that this is kind of like, this is why we do a retreat, right? right? This is, we're trying to accomplish team building, socialization, uh, and strategic thinking, what, whatever it is, like these are the two, three things that we do in a retreat. And then as people come and go and they've got other ideas, um, maybe it fits in, maybe it doesn't, but at least there's something in writing. So, yes. it's, you know, it's, it becomes more sustainable. Don, Don? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to, to put another point into Sarah's position. One of the um, complex things that we have is each supervisory, supervisory district has a uh, different election cycle. So we're not all going at the same time. So it's a constant flow of new folks. So you don't have any group dynamics that you can build, unfortunately. Can that be changed? That's a town, dis that's a district uh, decision. District by district. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, normally we, there's two towns that do, two districts that are May time frame. We're May, FBA is also May time frame this year because we decided to push off with our town and vote yeah. because of the pandemic. But, so all of us go and then in the group two, they don't go until the end of May, so then June is when so we have board members coming on in March and then we're working on in May okay. um, right now. And that's yeah. just basically because, like John said, it's how it is by per yeah. So, so it, could it be yeah. changed? I'm not sure. <laughs> Somebody would have to request it. Right. Ethan? Yeah, hi. Uh, just, uh, we're actually, uh, our said's working on uh, vision goals and well, what's it? Vision, mission, statement, and goals right now, with the specific purpose that our um, that exactly this. When we're gone, um, there is something there that's a usable document that it literally tells. It's a statement of how we make decisions or why we make decisions, and we're going to pr present it at our informational meeting um, next week. I'm not sure it's perfect yet, but it's a certainly it's a first stab at having that context that then future boards or future members as they come on they can look at that and it's like oh okay that's a very clear statement of um of how how we want to run this this and maybe we want to tweak this um so that's something we're working on and i think i i feel uh, positive about that so so it's a very valuable exercise to go through and create a strategic plan but it becomes much more powerful when your board meeting agendas are tied to the plan. So tonight we're talking about goal number two, objective three, whatever your nomenclature is. Um, and this is why we're having this conversation is because it's in the strategic plan. Very importantly related to that is the measurability, right? So it, it, it's great to have the statements and people may look at it and say, oh, okay, now I know but how will you measure success? That, that's a critical part of the conversation. Um, not just that we have a nice mission, vision, and goals, and we all agree to these goals, but we agree to how we're measuring success on these goals. Uh, th then you get powerful. That alignment and measurement. I I've thought a lot the last several years, you know, that good governance could be organized into the acronym FAST or FASTER, um, that it's focused, that it's aligned, that it's stretching. 
So we're not simply settling for status quo uh, and then that it's tracking. Um, I actually had read in a book called Measure What Matters and they had it as FATS. And I thought not only was FATS a bad word, but it was um, not even in the right order. It, it's got to be focus, align, stretch, and then track. Right. But then realized at some point, well, there needs to be a, a continuous improvement process here. So if we evaluate and revise or we make it faster, then um, then we've got something to kind of hang on to. Uh, not everything about good governance falls into that schema, but probably many of the most important things do. Uh, we know what we're focused on. We've got clear priorities. We've identified our goals. Uh, we're aligning the work and the reporting of the board and the system based on those goals. Um, they're stretch goals uh, because as with any goal, if, if we could easily attain it, what would be the point? But it, it's the tracking progress. You know, it's um, whatever life goal somebody wants to have, if it's fitness, if it's financial, if it's whatever, it, it's really not until you're, you're measuring on a regular basis, am I making progress? that you start to make progress. Um, somebody can say they're gonna go somewhere and do something, but then when they start checking how close they're getting, they're much more likely to get there. Sorry, it doesn't work that way, losing weight. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> if you set a goal and then you track your progress, you still don't lose? Well, <laughs> no, no, not, not so much. Yeah. Doctors on the call or? I'm sorry? I was asking if there were any doctors on the call. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Anything else meeting management, meeting protocols I could help you with? I mean, I, I have these slides, and I think nearly all of them are repetitive of what I had before. Um, just kind of underscore, you know, that this practice that you have in place of reporting out on the goals in your meetings, that's extremely healthy. Um, again, being mindful of what's on your agenda. I, I shared with uh, the folks in the webinar earlier kind of a rubric for assessing your board and um, chairs will get that by email. I could email it tomorrow to Jamie or something. And then um, you might look at that. You know, it's, it's five correlates of functional teams, trust, communication, commitment, accountability, and results. And then a look at where are we at as a team on this continuum. It could be helpful. Go ahead, Eric. Right. Will, first step, Will. 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 Yeah, sorry. Um, borrowing my wife's computer tonight. Um, oh. um, hey, Phil. Thanks. Um, I I wasn't here earlier, so um, just wondering if we might be able to get those slides or something so we can just take a look and maybe you know I'm sure Don can fill us in at the next meeting, but I'm certainly interested and we're you know we're trying to look at developing. Kind of a, a written protocol, you know, proceed protocols for our board. Um, I was also interested to see if uh, I know. I think Jamie had shared a couple of other board documents like that. Are other boards developing like a formal protocol, or is it more just kind of like informal? Yeah, no, they're they're formal written documents, and we can supply you some templates or something. Jamie probably already has. I. There's Stacy seconding that request. Yeah, I, I think it's important. You know, the, the first thing I did as a board chair was call a workshop for us to review a draft board operating protocol. And uh, it seemed critical to me that we have a written document. This is how we do things. Um, I, that board still has an almost identical operating protocol 17, 18 years later. So um, it's kind of stood the test of time. The, the protocol, though, like your vision statement, it has to be reviewed every year. And, and new members need to be able to assimilate to it, put their finger on it. Um, I've seen practices, I'll share a couple, I've seen where people, boards actually make it part of their policy. So that it's got the weight of district policy. And I, I've seen it also where boards will revisit and have folks sign it every year. Now, every now and then you can get a rogue member, and that's probably too harsh of a word. A person can, for whatever reason, not agree to sign it. There's nothing you can do about that. 
but it's a pretty cool thing if you've got a short written document that says this is how we're going to conduct our business and everybody's signed off on it um, on an annual basis. Again, if you don't revisit those things every year, they're not only stale, they're lost. Um, they just don't, you know, like a strategic plan on a shelf. They, they don't help just because you wrote the document. They help because you, you actually refer back to it. All right, guys, anybody got anything else for Phil? Uh, thank you for, for coming and for your guidance uh, and uh, your experience. This is a request to bring back to your organization. Um, what we do, there's, I don't know any other, maybe in the city where you've got major crime and everything else, but I don't know what's more important than public education. And that said, every supervisory union, and we're doing very well, but we need to do better, and we need to figure out how to do better and work together better. And so that really speaks to the importance in, I think, the stretch of your organization. Uh, but, uh, and one of the good signs is you're here. I hope that's a good And I, uh, I was just taken by that. I'm just very, 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 very pleased by that. So with your talent, everything else, how can you effectively communicate skills, ideas, uh, concepts um, to uh, the constituency? We're in a constituency here in SU and on the screen, and we've got all our district chairs here. Um, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but yeah. we can understand not only what, but the why and then the how, as you mentioned. Um, and I, I just, I think we all have a responsibility, but I want to just, Vermont School Board Association, I think, um, uh, can and should do better. And, uh, that's not a complaint. I'm just saying we need you. Well, and, and we have these piles of resources. So how do we get the most important ones, like the just in time idea, right? How, how do you get it when you actually need it? Here are these three tips. And, um, and anyway, I've only been here a few weeks. We've talked about those kinds of things and adding something to newsletters or having distinct documents that, you know, here's the five ways to do this or the three top three things to know about that. Responding to the media, um, dealing with equity or equity concerns or complaints or, yeah. you know, how do you bulletize that? Um, and then maybe have some substance underneath it so the bullets are fresh in your mind when you need them, but you've got a resource to refer back to. Yeah, and I was just thinking, I'm just uh, brainstorming with you, and I'm sorry I've taken too much time, but um, maybe um, I think every organization needs to set their goals. Yeah. But wouldn't it be great if they shared those goals with your organization? And you could look at those goals and say, gee, we could help you here, we could help you there. Um, and so that would strengthen that connection point and because we, you'd have a clear idea of what we're working on. And uh, so that's just one suggestion. You all, you do have some best practices happening in your review of data and monitoring that could become part of a repository uh, that's similar, maybe it's my word, you didn't quite say it, but you know, maybe we could warehouse sort of exemplars, here's yep. some best practices from this SU, from that district, from this other corner of the state for, for people that, in certain categories, um, something. Sorry. It's good to meet many of you virtually. I look forward to meeting in person at some point. And, um, please let me know how I can best be of help to any of you. Yeah, um, thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you. Right. Really appreciate it. All right, guys. On this up, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you all have my uh, my report um, in in front of you, so I am happy to take any questions. I think uh, there's not there's more details around things that we've talked about all year uh, in terms of professional learning that we're doing, how we're thinking about our curriculum, and sort of the really um, tight links we want to see between proficiencies, instruction, formative and summative assessment, um, and a lot of that's going to guide that work over the summer. Uh, as we sort of gathered data all year, and that data looks 
um, that's you know, classroom observation data, that's academic data, that's um, conversations with teachers and principals and family data. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we are we are doing. Um, Jamie already talked about the uh, assessment calendar and what you'll see in June. I, I'll just note right now that um, we are we extended the window on our local assessments a little bit um, heading into June. I think we'll still hopefully wrap them all up before your board meetings, but we're um, trying to relieve a little bit of the tension valve on both students and teachers uh, as they looked at all the assessments happening in the spring. And so um, it is certainly something we are going to um, sort of tighten or, or better align for next year. Um, but in the immediate term, we are just trying to make sure that um, people are doing, you know, are, are doing the assessments and also still uh, doing instruction in between that. So we have extended that window a little bit. Um, so I'm just giving you all that heads up. Um, I think that's the bulk. I'm happy to talk about anything else that's in there. Oh, this is, um, I feel like it's maybe been all year. This is heavy grant writing season. So we've got the, the opening of the, um, the consolidated federal grants, that's the, the titles. Um, opening up right now, uh, as well as continuing to work on different ESSER reporting. And so uh, when we're not out um, in classrooms talking to teachers and principals, we're doing a lot of um, grant writing on this end. So. Questions, Alanda? No? Well, Chef, sure. take that as a good sign. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, one last thing. <laughs> got more, yeah. Okay. yeah, sorry, one thing that's not included, I did want to hit, we have one new hire, um, uh, which is a new uh, One Planet director. Uh, and so uh, a very hard role to fill after having uh, Carrie, I think, in the role for 16 years. It's something uh, that runs very smoothly, um, and we feel really confident that our incoming director, who is a current classroom educator, uh, but also has a lot of experience in uh, kind of managing nonprofits and are and working in different nonprofits and um, and that sort of thing uh, will do a great job in coming into that role. And that's uh, Haley Zoride. Zoride. Um, yeah, so I had mentioned it a couple months ago that okay. Carrie was looking to go. Um, and so Carrie, I, I think it was two meetings ago, I had said was considering moving on. She was pursuing her... Um, Credentials to be an investment advisor um, in an upstart company in Burlington. Um, and she did pass her test to do that. So she's doing complete career change. Um, she is interested in um, possibly, I don't think she might be sharing this, in serving on the board at Rochester Stockbridge in the future. That's something that she has aspirations to do, which would be great. Um, Carrie is um, committed to staying with us through the end of May and also continuing to do some work as we onboard our new director. And we do have an assistant director, of course, which is part-time, um, Wendy, who plans to stay on. Um, but Carrie's been here a long, long time. I, uh, as I had said a couple months ago, um, you know, she would laugh probably if I, if she was here, I, I was actually hoping she didn't pass her test because I'm gonna really miss working with her. Um, Carrie and I actually worked together when she first started. I did summer programming in One Planet. Um, back right, we were both kind of were doing after school stuff together at the same time in this in the old Orange Windsor SU. And so, uh, yeah, I'm gonna miss seeing Carrie in the office and uh, all the really good work she did. Summer, she's she's very detail oriented. Summer is well planned. It's gonna carry off well. Um, but we're certainly gonna, I'm gonna really greatly miss her um, as a colleague. Although she did, like I said, commit that she would stay on board um, to support us when we needed it. And I do think we'll be tapping into her uh, throughout the upcoming year. Uh, and the grant's not due for two years, which is good news. Uh, the 21st century grant um, is not due for two more years. Any other questions on that, guys? So, so is that a the one planet coordinator is a full time position? Is that right? Yeah, year round. Yep. Okay. So we're losing a teacher. Sharon's going to lose a teacher. Yeah. yeah. She's going to resign her position. Yeah, with Sharon. Okay. She's great. 
my daughter's in her class right now, so she'll be great as that as that position as well. But thanks, Will. Yeah. Sad to lose her as a teacher. Yeah. One of the things that I was excited about, though, is this idea of how do we foster leadership from within the organization. I was excited to see one of our teachers look to step in uh, into a leadership position. That's one of the things I think good organizations do is that we do try to cultivate that idea of um, growing our own. And I, I think that we've got some folks in our teaching ranks who are uh, thirsty for that. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're looking at is how do we cultivate that as teacher leaders, right? Um, you know, I feel really good that our admin team's gonna be, is in a really solid place. And I'm not expecting um, really any turnover here for the next couple of years. Um, but how do we look to give folks who are in our organizations who want to pursue leadership opportunities uh, through, you know, teacher leaders um, so that we're not losing them, but we're really trying to build a bench. Um, and so I'm feeling like we're, we're starting to get to a place where we can start to do some of that work. Okay. Yep, you're up. <laughs> Ours right. this time. All right. You also have a, a my report. Um, a lot of the work is the same as what I reported out last month, just because it's it's ongoing and takes a lot of time. It's definitely our our busy season right now as we're trying to you know wrap up this school year and also plan for extended school year services ESY and plan for the start of next year. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we're doing. So our professional development is still continuing. Um, even our professional development in the summer is currently planned. Um, ESY services, we're again working with Carrie and One Planet to kind of align um, and that's looking really good. Um, and then um, hiring um, is like, is is busy, but it's a wonderful busy, um, especially after the last couple of years. Um, currently, I've, I had uh, this hiring season, I started with nine special educator openings um, that were just kind of carried over from last year's hiring season. So far, I've, I have filled seven out of the nine. Um, so we have, I have two new hires to let you all know about. Um, Matthew Velke um, will be coming to be a special educator um, at South Royalton Elementary um, in the fall. Um, he comes uh, originally from Massachusetts. Um, he spent a year here in Vermont, so um, it's great to have him on board. Um, and then also I have Dana Decker who will be coming on board. Um, and she will be a special educator um, for Stockbridge Rochester. Um, she will also be doing that work, um, will be some of her full-time position. Another section of her full-time position will be like a working um, with us at the SU and admin level um, around equity. Um, but she also has um, background and training with that um, as well. So she's, she's coming on kind of helping us out in kind of a dual, dual purpose, um, which is super exciting. She's very passionate about that majority of her jobs special special ed, ed. yes um, okay, <laughs> um so yeah so things are looking great and also um our building principals um put in their uh like bi-weekly newsletters kind of our other openings um that we had available our paraeducator openings custodians maintenance um those kind of openings and um, we, I've got a huge boom of um, people who are inquiring about being paraeducators. Wow. So it was great that just putting it in like our, our little parent newsletter has just caused like this nice kind of um, influx of people. So most of my morning was emailing people back who, um, who were emailing to inquire saying they saw it in the newsletter. Um, so I started a bunch of conversations, set up a few interviews already. So that was really exciting um, to, to <laughs> see it in just in our in our newsletter. Um, so things are going really well, and so just super excited about kind of wrapping up the year and also planning for next year. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's great news. Yeah. 
Anybody got questions for Annette? Could I add something real quick? Mm -hmm. It just made me think of it. Sorry, I, I just wanted to add and, and ask your questions. I am try I am working to plan uh, to have a booth at the Tumbridge Fair this fall uh, that's dual purposed. One, to talk about the work we're doing as a school system uh, and to collect feedback on how we're doing. And then also to um, use it as a job recruitment opportunity. <laughs> Um, and so I'll, I'll be talking more to the boards about that as we, as it's, you know, as those dates approach, but it would definitely be nice to have a, some board presence if board uh, members were interested, um, because, you know, I really would like us to try to have someone there visible throughout the entire four days. Um, and it, you know, it does collect a lot of our, our local community. And I think there's folks that could possibly work in our organization who just never thought they had the skill set um, to do that work. And actually they may be really skilled um, to be a substitute teacher um, or a paraprofessional or work in our cafeterias. Mm -hmm. um, and so as Annette was talking, I just, I wanted to start mm -hmm. to talk about that. So folks, if you're uh, a big fan of the Tumbridge Fair, mm -hmm. um, that you might consider uh, mm -hmm. being at that table. Nice. All right, guys, Tara. So you all have my report. I'll just give a brief update. We are on target for pre-audit. I will be uploading all the materials to the auditors at the end of this week, and then they will be doing the pre-audit the week of May 9th. Christmas. My world right now. And if there's any questions. Well, you got off really easy, like two cents. I have a question. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just wondering from other conversations we've had, how it's been working with them this year. They have been phenomenal. Anytime I've needed a question answered, Josh is right there for us. So he's been great. Good. A new team of auditors I, we really have a great relationship with. So. Good. That's good to hear. Thanks. All right. Anything else of Tara? Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Wednesday. Okay. <clears throat> As I bring up my report, uh, I'd like to share that we uh, got positive results from our uh, E-rate filings. Uh, USAC, the uh, United Service Access Corporation, whatever the name is, my apologies, uh, confirmed that the things that we had filed for were in the right categories and will be will be funded. So. Um, uh, as we're back to school, lots of assessment happening in our buildings where we now have new and improved Wi-Fi. And then uh, to support instruction and assessment <clears throat> at this window and uh, using ESSER money. And then uh, some the new Newton website and some Herald coverage there at the end. I would uh, also entertain any any questions? Stacy? Hi, Ray. Hello. I wanted to know if there were any buildings left without modernized Wi Fi? Or if so, we have. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, okay. Bethel and Royalton were not anticipated as part of this. So, our speaker before was talking about being strategic. And uh, the ability to use ESSER money to pull ahead these projects that were going to be a year from now, right? Bethel and Royalton were new three years ago, let's say. Right? So their okay. site would not be for another two years. Got it. We requested money for that as part of ESSER. I'm not sure how that will fall. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um. Policy committee. So we met again since the last full board meeting. Yep. Yeah, I don't know if I can hear you, Kathy. When you talk. um, so policy committee. Uh, I was just trying to remember if we set our next committee date. Yeah, it's the Monday before the next full board meeting, so, and we were gonna have two policies for review by the full board. So Monday before the next board meeting, full board meeting, it's and at we'll five. Be at five will be the next policy committee meeting. 
and we have the two policies that we're working on that we'll have to present to the full board that night. Which is social media, just so folks remember, and, and this uh, revised uh, residency verification for uh, tuition payments. Um, so full board will have a, a reading on, on both of those um, next this upcoming month, next month. Um, uh, Superintendent's Evaluation Committee, um, we're working on goals. Um, we need to change the date. I'll send an email out to the group that's on that committee, but we need to change the date. Um, we're looking at doing it at 7 o'clock on the 12th, I believe, is when it's actually going to be able to work, but I will send an email to the committee to, to discuss that. Um, Does that mean Thursday's meeting is not happening? Correct. Thanks. Correct. Yes. Um, discussion items. Proposed changes to meeting calendar for members and districts. So I put a I put a draft of what it could possibly look like in August, based on all the conversations we've been having. Um, I think all of our board chairs are on now. So I mean. My sense is that it was fairly well received by member districts, this concept, acknowledging like it may need to be tweaked and that we acknowledge it's a working plan, that it, it, that it could be tweaked. Um, and so this would just give a little bit of a sense of what it could look like. Um, and so the proposal would be that the district meetings and the SU meetings would all actually go to Tuesday nights um so that it's predictable um and it would allow really monday for folks to get kind of their their sea legs under them potentially and get well prepared for meetings um and then what we would allow for and you can kind of see as a placeholder there i didn't name them uh but like for negotiations if we have a special meeting where we need a board to take action on something um uh, we have finance committees we have um, energy committee, which keeps getting bumped currently right now because we keep having it line up over top of each other, um, that those could happen on Thursday nights and we could get like a set rotation down possibly. Um, and so that's sort of what I was showing here is that essentially we'd be out Tuesday, Thursdays, because I think we would have committees most Thursdays. Um, and but that would get us to about an average of you know two meetings per week uh which seems really doable compared to what we get sometimes um and the thought process around this was is that one board would actually start at 5 30 and then the other board would start at 6 30. um so that the su office staff would be with a board to do business that needed that attention and that we would build the agenda to um, align so that that the that this the first meeting the central office staff would be done so that they could then move to the other district meeting would be the idea um, instead of bringing both districts together and then breaking off again um, and so I don't know how what, how folks feel about that but I do think it may allow for a little more focused discussion I don't mind. Um, you know, speaking to my report twice, because I think sometimes the report has a little different flavor at times based on the work of a certain district. Um, and so that's that's sort of the proposal there. We have not set yet who would go early and who would go later. That's still information we need to discuss. Based on initial conversations, that's how I paired up boards for now and geographically uh, around Jihad, Arsad, F. Bud Stratford, Rudd, Sharon, and the policy would act committee, I think, would actually go at five, and the full board would start at six. It says 530. But, we decide how yeah. Going on. yeah. And, you know, part of my thought with it says committee slash specials is if we did have two things happening on a Thursday, there may be the opportunity to go at 530 and 630 or 530 and seven based on business. Again, I think that, that we may be more productive and able to do that based on the fact that we're just out the two nights a week versus, you know, sometimes four. Don had a question. Don? 
<laughs> idea is is the thought process still full boards every other month or are we going to do those monthly now you know i think we should talk about that don i think we've been continuing to warn full boards because the board development series we've been doing and then budgeting but i think it's it's worthwhile for the board to talk about because um i also feel like with this technology we've been getting better attendance mm -hmm. you know it seems so I do think that that is a really worthwhile conversation for the full board um, when we reorg in June um, to talk about how do we want to go about that process. Because you're right, we really have been doing full boards monthly at this point. Right. And the, the executive board really served a purpose more when we were having such a hard time getting forums. Now we haven't really struggled with that. Sarah? Um, with the um the Tuesday meetings that were, uh, you know, like Stratford and FBUD, would they be hybrid meetings like um, they are now? Yeah. I, I mean, unless the board said otherwise, I think for attendance purposes, it's worked well. I also think for uh, community, my thought process is like, if that, if that meeting location was worn an example in Chelsea, Sarah, I, I really think having a hybrid option for someone from Stratford to be able to attend. The meeting still right not not feel like that's a, although chelsea and stratford are chelsea tumbridge and stratford i don't know if it's it for some people in stratford chelsea's probably closer than tumbridge so it might not have been a great example but i think you get what i'm trying to say um yeah i think that's important for both both districts to have that option ethan uh just to uh, uh, first I, I really like this it's certainly worth a try um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it may, it, there may be traffic jams, especially on Thursday night, possibly, but I think the idea of organizing it like this just makes a lot of sense. And I, I certainly want to try it. Um, I'm just wondering if we run into any legalities of warning, uh, uh, uh we'd have to warn two separate physical locations because two separate boards are meeting on that night. Is that correct? We would still want the same physical location. We would just designate where the each board's actually meeting. Okay. So, okay. So that's yeah. So it would still be like let's say Rochester, Rochester, and Hancock or something like that as the as the as the spot. Even cool. though there's it's it's not really one meeting. It is two meetings. I yep. guess that's it. Would be yeah, two okay. meetings, two agendas. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Well. Yeah. Just I was just thinking about if you're gonna do two hybrid meetings does that mean you're gonna to have to have two setups probably because they're yeah, not going to necessarily setups. end yeah okay so we have the capacity to do that yep we do it now in negotiations cool all right guys any other questions around the calendar i didn't put it for any type of action i just was letting you discuss more. that was my question Wait, you had what's said the, what's, August, the, what's the next step right you would well I, I actually think and the board can correct me if i'm wrong i actually think what we need to do is bring this back to all your local districts because okay. you've set your you've designated your meeting times and locations so if folks right now are feeling good about this what i would actually do is we would bring it back to districts who have already set their meeting locations um, and have them look to change that starting in August by a motion. And then when you reorg, those districts would, um, you know, set this type of schedule now that you have it. Okay. Would that my thought process, Ethan. Well, would it be worth um, at least the board chairs of the two groups that are meeting talking together? Because, you know, we, we may say, hey, 530 works for us, and they may say 530 works for them. But if we actually communicate, um, it might actually save some negotiation time as far that as who goes. That sounds um, like a good idea. Yes, because that's the one thing I don't know yet of who was yeah. going to go first and who was okay with going later. I know, example, um, the one that I do know is that Rudd was advocating to go later and Sharon was okay to go at 530. So that one, I feel like we've got. Um, the other ones, I you know, F. Bud Stratford, I think we need to talk. And Jihad Arsa needs to talk. So, Stacy, if you and I chat at least a little bit, maybe before our meeting. Let's talk. Yeah, you've got my talk. number. 
Okay. Yeah, I can get together. <laughs> yep. Okay. Let's we'll do figure it. it out. Thank you. All right. Um, so the next thing will be for it to go to our individual boards. Yep. Okay. Um, executive committee, executive session. Yeah, I think we should. So we're going to go. Um, I need a motion to go to executive session for labor relations. So moved. Second. Inviting the superintendent. Okay, go, Sarah. Make a motion to come out of executive session. Second. All right, so moved. Um, we already talked about new hires. Yep. I don't have any resignations. Our next meeting is Monday, May 23rd at 6 p.m. And I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second, third, fourth. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night.